Okay, she needs to unmute me. Um, um, uh, uh, video. There we go. Unmute me, Kate. So I'm going to ask you and Felicity to come. You're unmuted, Susan. I can hear you. Still on my computer. Elisha. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us on this session of Conservation in the Classroom, where you get to interact with one of our very own experts here at WWF. My name is Kate. I will be the host for today's event. And before we dive in, we want to go around and give all of our classes that are joining us live on camera a chance to say hi and introduce themselves. Also, we have quite a few classes that are joining us live off camera. So please feel free to introduce yourself using the chat function on your screen and we'll give you a shout out as soon as we go through our classes on camera here. So when I say your teacher's names, students, this is your time to say hi to everyone that's watching, okay? So let's start with Miss Blanchard's class from Knoxville, Tennessee. How are you guys doing? Okay, next up we have Miss Hawk's class from Lebanon, Ohio. Great. And from Yapank, New York, we have Miss Wolford's class and their slow Loris Stella joining us. What's up, guys? Hi. Look at Stella there. Okay. Um, next up, Miss Irwin's class from Parker, Colorado. All right, and finally, we have the crew Knight joining us from Olympia, Washington. Okay, great. Thank you guys all so much for joining us. It's good to see you. And we have a few classes here on the chat that have introduced themselves here. So I wanna get the opportunity to say hi to them. Let's see. We have from Port Orange, Florida, Horizon Elementary. What's up, fourth graders? We have Walls Elementary joining us from Kent, Ohio. Um, we have a third grade class from there. From Claremont, Florida, we have fourth graders at Imagine South Lake. We have Miss Kudrick's class from Matamoris, Pennsylvania. What's up, guys? Also, Mrs. Whipple's fifth grade class from Austin, Texas. The Cool School from Nova Scotia, Canada, and Cowan Elementary from Austin, Texas. Thank you all so much for joining us. Again, any of you that are watching off camera, feel free to put your name in there and start gathering questions for our presenter, which is the reason you guys are all here today. Our expert, Linda Walker, who is a senior director with the forest program here at WWF. Linda works with companies to make sure that they're creating forest products responsibly in a way that doesn't destroy these amazing habitats. Today, she's going to talk to you all a bit about all of the good things that forests give to us and what we can do to help protect them. So without further ado, Linda, if you wanna take it away, it is all yours. All right, well, hi everyone. Can I get a wave? Can you hear me? Great. I'm so happy to be with all of you here today to talk trees. Before I talk about me, I'd like to get to know you all a little bit better. So I'd like to ask you three questions. 
my first question, raise your hand if you like trees. Awesome. Raise your hand if you like to climb trees, climb up trees. All right, and raise your hand if you like to take walks in the woods or go camping. Awesome. Yeah, we've got a good crowd today. I think I have a feeling this is gonna be fun. All right, well, I am going to share my presentation with you and we're gonna talk about trees as superheroes. All right, we good? Great. All right, well, I know most of you probably have a favorite superhero. I'd like to introduce you today to my favorite superhero, the tree. I see trees as superheroes because they do so many amazing things for people and our planet. I'm gonna tell you about a few of those things today that make trees so awesome. And then I'll describe the ways that you can be a superhero for trees and our planet. Sound good? Okay, great. First, I'll just tell you a little bit more about me. I grew up in New Jersey in the US. This is a picture of me and my dad in the woods behind the house that I grew up in. It's a woods that my sister and my cousin and I played in all the time when we were little. So I started liking trees from the time I was about your age. And I'll bet you can guess the picture of me that's from that time. <laughs> I loved trees even back then. The other picture is of me doing my current job at the World Wildlife Fund after I went to school to study more about trees and forests. My job is a conservationist. So I work to keep trees and forests healthy by working with companies that make products like wood and paper that are made from trees. And I really like my job. So I'm going to give you a list of few of the superpowers of trees that I think are so cool. Tree superpower number one. Trees make oxygen that we need to live. They suck in carbon dioxide from the air, and that's represented by these little blue dots labeled CO2. And they make oxygen that we breathe in. That's the green arrows going out from the trees. Now I'd like to ask you all to take just a minute, take a very deep breath in and hold it, okay? You just breathed in some oxygen that a tree made. Now let it out. How about we all say together, thanks trees for making that oxygen for us. Thanks trees. Awesome. Okay, tree superpower number two. Trees filter the water that we drink so that it stays clean. The roots of trees are really important. They help keep the soil in place so it doesn't erode into our streams and rivers. Trees also give off water vapor from their leaves. That water goes up into the sky, makes clouds, and then comes back down as rain. Pretty cool. Tree superpower number three, this is probably going to be one of your favorites. Trees and the forests that are made up of a lot of trees provide home to most of our planet's animals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. So I'm going to show you a few pictures now of animals that live in trees or forests. And as I show you these pictures, I want you to raise your hand if you know what these animals are, okay? We don't have a slow loris, but one of, you, one of you do, so I think that's really cool. Okay, I'm going to start with my favorite. Raise your hand if you know what this is. It's an orangutan. An orangutan is my favorite animal. And these apes live in tropical forests in Indonesia, which is halfway around the globe. 
They spend most of their lives in trees. They even make a nest out of sticks every night to sleep in, a different one, and they get most of their food from trees. I got to live and work in the forest on the island of Borneo in Indonesia for several months, and I got to see some of these amazing creatures. They're an endangered animal now because a lot of the forests they live in have been cut down, but there's still some really good populations and, that are thriving there. Okay, next animal. Raise your hand if you know what this one is. This is another cool ape. It's a gorilla. And these gorillas live in the rainforest in Africa. Next slide. Anybody know what this one is? It's an owl. And specifically, it's a great gray owl. And these owls live in another kind of forest called the boreal forest, up in places like Canada and farther north where it's colder in Europe. There's lots of pine, spruce, and fir trees, kind of like some, some of the trees that we use for Christmas trees come from up there. So boreal forests are um, really common up in Canada and places farther north where it's cold. Okay, next animal. I'll bet a lot of you know this one. Raise your hand if you know what this one is. This is one of probably our most common animals in, in the United States and North America. It's the white-tailed deer. We have a lot of these in the US. I'll bet a lot of you have seen them. So the reason we have a lot of them in the US is partly because we don't have as many predators as we used to, like the wolves. And we don't have as many forests as we used to so we see a lot more of them in our communities and neighborhoods. And last animal I'm gonna show you, this is a cool video of an animal that's really hard to see because it moves so quietly and has spots that camouflage it. So check this out. Anybody know what this one is? It roams around the forest in the Amazon in South America and it's the jaguar, really special animal that lives in Central and South America. Teachers, I know you probably use a lot of maps with your kids, so maybe you can show them where some of these places are after we talk. Cool. Okay, back to more tree superhero characteristics. Superpower number four of trees is the way that they provide medicines, food, and shelter to what we call indigenous people. Now, indigenous might be a new term for a lot of you. Indigenous people are people who have lived off the land and in forests for a long, long time, like our own American Indians, Eskimos, and First Nations people in Canada. Those people rely on forests to survive, and trees have superpowers that give them food, shelter, and medicine that can really help keep, keep those communities thriving. Here's another one that's probably a favorite for you. Trees give us lots of yummy food. These are just some of the fruits and nuts that come from trees. I'll bet you all recognize two of these pictures from things you eat pretty often, the apple tree and bananas. But I wonder how many of you know the other picture on this slide. This one isn't so common. It's a Brazil nut that comes from a country called Brazil in the Amazon. And this is a nut that grows on trees down there in the rainforest. Final superpower, number six, this is the last one. Trees make wood and paper products that we use every day. And they can be found in every room of your home, places where your family, your parents might work and in your school. And for you teachers, this is an, uh, an image from an interactive uh, web page that we have on our WWF site that we'd be happy to share after uh, the presentation. And you can click through any of the magnifying glasses on this interactive page and learn about where you can find things in your home, at work, or at school that are made from trees. I'm just gonna click on a couple made from trees um, that are at your school now. So one might be your auditorium where you have chairs and maybe a stage that are made of wood. 
your gym that has a floor basketball court that might be made of wood, the bleachers. You might be surprised to see soccer balls, but did you know that rubber, well, some rubber comes from rubber trees and that goes into things like your bicycle tires, car tires, and even soccer balls. Well, if you go down the hall in your restroom, you can find some paper towels and toilet paper. They come from trees. And finally, if you just take a minute right now to look around your classroom, I'll bet you can see a lot of things that come from trees. Easels, and countertops, your pencils, um, paper and books. So we can be grateful for the trees and the superpowers that they have to give us all these products that we use every day. I wanted to show you this map to just again talk about where on our planet most of our forests are. And if you go from left to right across this slide, you might recognize North America, the US and Canada. Those are where the deer and that owl I talked about live, the boreal forest. Um, and South America, which is where the Amazon forest and the jaguar lives. If you keep going across the map, you can see Africa and that big green spot in the middle is the Congo Basin where the, the gorillas live. If you go all the way over to the right, the green blotches, that's Indonesia where the orangutans live. Now, unfortunately, about half of the forests that we have on the planet right now are in trouble. And you know how all super ha superheroes have things that they have to battle with, have villains that they're trying to, to fight back against? Well, it's the same with trees. So now we're gonna talk about a couple things that can hurt our trees as superheroes. And then we'll talk about things that people are doing to help, help the trees. First, there are places in the world where trees are being cut down in a big area and replaced with houses or crops for, for agriculture. And when that happens, all those tree superpowers I mentioned can get a little bit weaker. Second, some insects can be villains killing lots of trees at one time, like you see in this picture. But many insects and beetles are really good and helpful for trees. But sometimes there's an invasion of trees that can really wipe out um, a whole area of trees at one time. And finally, you've probably all seen some of these pictures over the past few months. Pictures from California and the wildfires there pictures from the Amazon, and recently pictures from Australia where there's fire, bushfires there that are burning the trees and the shrub, shrub areas. These are really hard pictures to see because when we see these pictures, it means that the people and communities are being affected and the animals are, might be being hurt. Some of these fires have happened because our climate is getting warmer and that's making some of these more intense um, weather events and fires happen around the world. Other fires happen because our forests are less healthy and maybe had too many branches um, building up in them. The good news is that we can protect our forests and manage them in a way that they stay healthy and, and strong. So now I wanna talk about some people and jobs um, that people have that are keeping trees healthy around the world. So I call these people um, tree superheroes. There's lots of different jobs that people do that relate to trees or forests. And these are just four of them. And I wanted to talk about, um, about these kind of jobs because I know this is um, the time where you might be talking about things you might wanna do when you grow up. So we'll start with the two on the top. The woman on the left is a conservationist like me. This is my friend, Amy, who works with me at World Wildlife Fund. She works with companies to make sure that the wood products and forest products they make uh, don't hurt trees. She also travels around the world to work with local communities and with governments to make sure that we have strong policies that keep forests healthy. The man on the right is a forest ranger. He works in places like national parks to keep protecting uh, the trees and other important areas within these park lands. 
On the bottom, on the left, we have a forester. Foresters manage the forest to help them stay healthy. This forester is marking a tree that's gonna be cut for a wood or paper product, but they do it in a way that tries to keep the forest um, healthy and providing these products over time. And the person on the lower right is an arborist. You may have seen one of these people in your neighborhood. They work on trees uh, oftentimes in cities or in neighborhoods, cutting off dead branches and giving trees some medicine that can keep them strong if they're sick. So those were a few superheroes that you might come across um, in your neighborhood or doing jobs, but I'm here to tell you that you too can be a superhero for trees. As you know, all superheroes need helpers to keep them strong. And there's several ways that you in your, in your schools and at home can be a superhero for trees as well. So that's what we wanted to spend our last few minutes talking about. There's four ways. The first, ways, first way you can be a tree superhero is by planting trees. Can you raise your hand if you have planted a tree before? I'll bet a lot of you have. This is a really important thing to do because the trees you plant now are gonna be big trees as you get older, providing things like shade in our communities and helping to put down roots and filter the water that we talked about before. And so get out with your families you, if you can this spring or summer and plant trees. It makes you feel good too. The second way you can help trees is to help protect the forests that are already out there. Get out there and enjoy forests and get involved in local organizations that are helping forests in your neighborhood or globally. You can ask your teachers or parents or families about ways that you can help organizations that are helping to protect trees in your own backyard or around the world. The third way that you can be a tree superhero is to recycle paper, use paper that has some recycled content in it, and look for ways to reuse wood products that you have in your school or at home to take pressure off of forests. And last but not least, you and your family can be superheroes for trees by buying products that come from forests that were managed in a way that keeps them healthy. It's okay to cut down some trees for wood and paper products because trees can regrow from seeds or, or just from seeds that they drop on the ground, but it has to be done carefully. So you and your family can look for products that have the check mark tree F S C label, like what you see in this picture. And I'm going to show you a short video about FSC and I'll read the words on the video while it plays. This is a poorly managed forest. Trees are unhealthy and not very diverse. There are not many plants or animals. Poor forest management and harvesting degrades the forest, causes problems like erosion of soil. Water gets polluted and working conditions are not safe, but it doesn't have to be that way. The Forest Stewardship Council standards ensure that forests are managed responsibly in a way that provides us with clean air and clean water, restricts chemicals on the ground, and follows strict harvesting and forestry practices that minimize things like erosion. They ensure a wide diversity of plants and animals and trees. They help ensure that it's safe for workers. They provide good jobs for the local community. and they respect the rights of local people. These are just some of the ways that the FSC standard protects our forests 
and the people and wildlife who depend on them. To support forests, look for that FSC checkmark tree logo when you shop for all these products. So remember, we need trees and trees need you. Thanks for being tree superheroes and thanks for participating today. I really appreciate it. Okay, thanks so much, Linda, for sharing that awesome presentation about trees and how they're great superheroes for all of us. So students, we're going to get started on the question and answer portion of the event right now. So now's your time to get those questions for Linda ready. And those of you that are watching off camera, if you have questions for Linda also, please make sure you write them in the chat and we will weave those in as we go through here. So we're gonna start with Miss Blanchard's class. If you have your first question ready for Linda, nice and loud for us. Emily, do you wanna come over here and ask your question right near the computer? Go how, the computer. How long do trees usually live? Hi, that's a great question. Well, some of the trees like we have in North America in the Pacific Northwest, they can live to be hundreds or even thousands of years old. It depends on where they grow and how they're taken care of. But some of the oldest trees on our planet are literally a couple, several hundred years old. Okay, that was a great first question. Let's move on to Miss Hawk's class in Ohio, if you guys are ready. I Again, if you guys are ready. Again. What would happen if all the trees in the world would just, would be gone? Uh, that would be pretty rough for all of us, you know, like the slides I showed at the beginning, we wouldn't have oxygen to breathe because trees really produce the oxygen we need to breathe every day. We wouldn't have a lot of the, um, of the things, the food that we need to eat. We wouldn't have clean water. I don't think we could really live on the planet without trees. The good news is we still have a lot of trees and there's a lot we can do to have even more. Let's hope that that never happens. <laughs> um, okay, next up is Miss Wolford's class with Stella. You guys are ready? Yeah. Why are there why are there different kinds of trees? Why are there different kinds of trees? That's a great question. And hi, Stella. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> There's different kinds of trees because. Our planet has had um, a climate that allows all sorts of different plants and animals to develop over hundreds and millions of years. And over time, in different parts of the world that have different types of, uh, different amounts of rainfall or different, um, you know, different patterns where it's hotter in some places in the world and it's drier in other places or colder in other places, trees have evolved to adapt to those kind of climates where it's wetter or drier. And so we have this wonderful diversity of trees that are different all around the world. Very different trees that we have here in the US compared to in the tropical regions where they get a lot more rain and it's a lot hotter and different from those boreal forests in Canada like I talked about because it's colder, a little bit drier up there and they don't have as much light. So that's partly why there's so many different kinds of trees in the world. Okay, another good question. Yeah. Next up from Colorado is Miss Irwin's class. If your audio is working, I hope here. Have you ever been scared, scared, um, scared <laughs> while in the forest or in a dangerous situation? 
Wow, that's a great question. Wow, Thank great you. Question. Thank you. I have been scared a few I times. I've been scared a few times. One time was when I was in uh, Russia. Russia is a place where there's tigers that live in the forest. And one time we were there in the very far eastern part of Russia. We were there in the winter time, and I saw a footprint of a tiger in the snow in Russia. And I was scared because I didn't know if the tiger was close by or not. We're, we didn't see him. I kind of wanted to see him, but I kind of didn't because I was a little bit afraid. But my, we didn't ever see him, but I knew they were close by because we saw them. And my friends in China, in Russia, actually made this little this little tiger for me out of wood that I brought today that I thought was really cute that maybe he can say hi to Stella. Hi, Stella. <laughs> great question. That's great. Um, okay, the crew night from Washington, if you guys are ready, nice and loud. When did the first tree grow? What caused it to grow? Did it grow from a seed? Wow, that's a that's a great question. Well, you know, I wasn't around when the first tree grew, so I'm going to have to make a guess here. But I would say that trees always come from seeds. So uh, there's probably a seed for it's kind of like a chicken and egg story, which came first, the chicken or the egg. But I would say there's a seed that came first, and it probably grew in a very wet, tropical, swampy place because millions of years ago, when the we started to have more plants and animals on the earth, it was very hot and swampy. So I think the first tree was probably one of those big swampy trees that you see when you look at movies of dinosaurs and stuff like that, where they were big palm trees and things like the brontosaurus or other... Uh, um, vegetarian dinosaurs would eat. Okay, um, we are actually going to take a few of the questions that have been put in the chat, Linda, if that's okay mm -hmm. with you. We've had sure. classes joining us off camera here. So I'm gonna ask a few that they've submitted. So from Oakland Audio Bond, we have the question, how do invasive species impact trees and can students help with invasive species removal like garlic mustard? Wow, fantastic question. You know, um, I showed that picture a little bit ago of trees, of forests that were unhealthy. Um, and I talked about beetles, but that's a really good question because invasive species is another thing that can make um, forests really unhealthy. And they can, invasive species can be other types of trees that may have come from other places in the world and where, um, and, and sort of invade and crowd out some of our species and trees that, that, um, that were here to begin with. But you can also have those kind of plants like garlic mustard or other vines or other, other um, plants that can grow and they can they can keep little trees from growing but they can also make it harder for other little wildflowers and things that are on the on the forest floor to live so absolutely there's things that you kids and your parents can do to help um, there's a lot of organizations like the audubon society and the nature conservancy and other local groups that have volunteer work days to remove invasive species along trails. And it can feel really good to be part of that because when you're doing that, you're helping the trees or the other plants, they're kind of the underdogs, um, get a little bit of help. So thanks for that question. It's a really, really important thing. Okay, the next question in the chat here is from Lambert's Leaders. They want to know, do we know how many trees are destroyed per year? Um, we don't, I know, we know more about the areas of the world that are, that are destroyed um, every year. Um, every year we lose about um, 23 million 
acres of land. And that equates to about the same number of football fields or soccer fields. So that's a lot. That's a really big area. And we um, were really concerned that we're losing that many forests. We're losing them because um, sometimes, like I said, they're being cut down for planting crops, um, like agricultural crops or things like palm oil that you may have heard about that goes into a lot of products that we eat or things like shampoo. Um, they're being cut down for, for houses and other things like that. But the good news is there's also a lot of, of people working on forest restoration, so tree planting, but also really working hard on growing more forests around the world. And we need to, uh, to try to do that to go faster than the trees are getting cut down. Okay, great. Um, we're going to start back up again with another round from our classes that are on camera, but don't worry, those of you that put your questions in the chat, we're going to do our, the best we can to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so let's go back to Miss Blanchard's class, if you're ready for your second question, nice and loud. How much oxygen does a tree produce a day? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know the exact answer, but I do know that different types of trees produce more oxygen than others. So a big tree will produce a whole lot more oxygen than a little tree, but I don't know the exact number, but I do know that we need all of them we have because oxygen is so important for us um, when we breathe. That was a really good question. Um, next That's up is Ms. Paul's class. Class. Can trees have a negative impact on animals and wildlife? Hmm. Can they have a negative impact? Well, sometimes they can, um, particularly if they are like we were talking about these invasive species and trees that are not supposed to be growing in a certain place. So if you have a tree that is not um, native or not supposed to be growing in a forest and it comes in and it starts to spread, then it can um, push out the trees that might make the food for the, uh, for the animals that live there. There's, uh, for example, in Indonesia where the orangutans live, some of the tropical rainforest there is getting cut down to plant other trees uh, that grow really, really fast. They call those tree plantations. And those trees go really, really fast and they can make a lot of paper from those trees, but it's almost like a farm field. There's no animals there because it's only trees growing really close next to each other. So in some cases, trees can hurt wildlife, but it's usually because people are making changes to the forest that make it so that animals can't live there anymore. Okay, next up we have Miss Wolford's class. What kind of medicine is made from trees? Oh, a great question. You guys are really well prepared. Um, there's a couple that come to mind. There is a tree called the Pacific Yew that's out in like Washington State and Oregon. And it makes, um, it has a chemical in the tree called Taxol and they can use that Taxol to treat cancer. So there's medicines like that that can come from trees. There's also uh, different uh, plants and, and trees in the rainforest um, that can make other products that are really good like for our skin, um, like aloe vera and other products that um, are really good to put on our, on our skin and our bodies like in lotions. But the Taxol is one that came to mind that is um, really beneficial for, uh, for, for healing. Okay, Miss Irwin's class, if you guys are ready, you're up next. What did you study to get your job? Well, I started when I was in college, I studied environmental science and biology. So with those classes, 
and geography, actually. So I got out outside a lot in all those classes. I learned about trees and the connection between the streams and the water and the plants. So I studied biology and I studied um, environmental science. And then I went on and I got another degree, a forestry degree, where I learned more, more specifics about trees and how trees grow and tree science and how to manage forests. So I started with environmental science and then I got a master's degree in forestry. Okay, and last but not least, Miss Knight's class, Crew Knight. <laughs> Let me just speak up then. How many ecosystems can be found in a tree? Oh, wow. Great question. Uh, you know, we often talk about ecosystems as a whole bunch of, of trees or like a really big area, like a whole watershed or a whole county, bigger, you know, bigger scale. But you are told that's a really good question because a tree can be its own ecosystem. If we think about some of the big old growth trees, like you might see in Northern California, um, you can have an eco part of the ecosystem is all the roots in the ground and the way that the roots kind of interconnect with each other. And actually there's ways that through the roots, the trees actually talk to each other. So that's part of the tree ecosystem. And then you have the tree itself where part of the tree is sucking up water from the ground and part of the tree from the leaves that, that are using the, water, the light from the sun, all those green leaves from the sun are making sugars and energy, and that goes back down through other parts of the tree. So there's that part of the tree that does all that stuff like the plumbing in the middle of the tree. And then at the top of the tree, there's a whole nother ecosystem because you can have animals that live or, or insects that live only in the top of the tree. And in some of these big old growth trees, like the giant sequoias out west, there's so much moss. There's so many big uh, branches at the top of the tree that moss and dirt and all that stuff forms up there. And you can have animals actually living up there that can't even see down to the ground because it's so dense. So it's a great question because a tree itself can be an ecosystem, but the tree can exist within this whole other ecosystem of other trees and forests and water and plants and animals. Okay, we are going to take a couple from the chat now again. Um, teachers, just so you know, I know that we are getting close to the 45 minute mark here. Um, we will continue and do one more round of questions with Linda, if that's okay. We'll do a third round. If you need to jump out, if you've got a commitment and you can't stay, we enjoyed having you here and you can always email Wild Classroom for any additional follow-up um, answers that you'd like from Linda. So we'll keep going here and I hope you can stay with us as long as possible. Um, let's see, from the chat, we have the Rotors third graders. They are asking about the wildfires in Australia. They were wondering how they're doing and how do wildfires like that usually start and kind of Piggybacking off that question, Linda, the Neeland family wants to know how much of the world's trees have been destroyed by those recent wildfires. Well, great question. That's been in the news a lot. Um, so what we, we know that the fires are still burning in Australia. They've gotten some of them under control, but it is an enormous area. I heard a couple of weeks ago, I live in the state of West Virginia in the US and I heard a couple of weeks ago that the fires had gotten to be the size of the state of West Virginia. So much larger than even the fires we had in California and Australia. Uh, you know, fires are, are a regular event, uh, bushfires are a regular event in Australia. They do happen every year, but the fires this year have been the biggest ever. And we are worried because we think that things like, like climate change and the uh, made have made the fires worse. Um, the good news is that there is a lot that's happening right now to help the wildlife like kangaroos and koala bears. Um, there's, there's been a lot of effort by World Wildlife Fund, our organization, and a lot of other groups. In fact, um, we even have, um, our, our Australia team even has now some sniffer dogs that are going out in Australia and trying to sniff out koala bear 
poo so they can find the koalas that might still be in those forests and need help and get them to help get them um, get them some food they need and maybe move them to places that that have more um, that haven't been burned. So that's just an example. There's also a lot of wildlife rescue that WWF is involved with. And I think that what these what what this is telling us is we we all need there's 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 something that all of us can do to be part of the solution. We need to find ways to make our forests more. Uh, there's a there's a vocabulary word that might be good for all of you if you don't know it yet called resilient. It means that they're healthier and able to to kind of be strong like a superhero even when all these things are kind of coming at them whether it's fires or floods or hurricanes. So planting trees and doing tree restoration, removing invasive species and getting involved are things that that you all can do um, that we can all do in in Australia and in our own backyard to to be part of that solution. So I think um, that, that the, these fires in Australia are really a strong signal that our, our planet needs, needs all of our help. And I'm really so excited because you guys are the next generation that can really help, help make our planet thrive for a long time in the future. And um, I'm really grateful that you all are here today and that you care about trees because um, they really need you. Okay, the next one from the chat is Valentino's VIPs want to know what causes the change in color in leaves? Oh, great question. Um, well, it kind of connects to that thing I said a few minutes ago about photosynthesis. So in the summertime, the trees have all these green leaves. And there's certain things that happen when it starts to get colder and when there gets to be a little bit less light um, in in. Um, when we get closer to the end of summer. Trees have, uh, leaves have this stuff called chlorophyll in them and that's what gives them the color. And when there's signals happen in nature where there's less light and, um, and it's colder, it, it changes the chemistry of those leaves and the green goes away and it, it basically makes these colors appear in certain leaves. But you, you probably noticed that not all trees change color and not all trees have the same kind of colors. So it's all related to the chemistry of the leaf itself, but it's mostly uh, the, the, the trigger in nature that uh, of, of temperature and light that says to the trees, it's time to start shutting down for winter. So those leaves shut down, then they fall off, then the trees kind of hibernate over winter and then they they leaf out in the spring again. Now that doesn't happen with the trees like pine trees and you know spruce trees and things like your Christmas trees because those are called evergreens. They don't change colors. But but some some trees that are called deciduous trees, they put out leaves and they change colors in the fall. It's a really cool thing, isn't it? I that's one of my favorite times of year. Springtime when we have things like cherry blossoms coming out, um, and fall when we get those great colors. Okay, so what we're gonna do, if we have the classes that are still joining us on camera, if you guys can narrow it down to one last kind of quick <laughs> speed round question for Linda, because I know we are very quickly running out of time. So we're just gonna go through the, the camera spots one last time. And like I said, this will be kind of a speed round here. So Miss Blanchard's class, last question. Does the water in the roots affect the climate? Yes. It, the cool thing is there's a lot of, of, of carbon, which is related to climate. There's a lot stored in the roots of plants and in the soil. So we need the soil and the roots to store carbon. And that's one way that we can keep our climate protected because we can keep storing that carbon in the, in the roots and the soil. Great question. That was a great question. Those roots and soil are very, very important too. Um, let's see, well, let's jump to Ms. Wolford's class. Which trees are the most endangered? What trees are the most endangered? I'd say the most endangered trees in the world are trees that live in some of those tropical rainforests, like in the Amazon, and uh, where the jaguar lives and the Congo Basin in Africa, where the 
gorillas live. And they're endangered because, like one that uh, comes to mind is the mahogany tree. Mahoganies are beautiful, big rainforest trees and their wood is beautiful. It's this rich brown, red color. And so the most endangered trees are the ones that have been cut down because a lot of people like to use that wood for really expensive furniture or uh, even guitars or things that, um, you know, really, really expensive furniture and guitars and some other musical instruments, flooring, um, some kind of wood floors. So it's when uh, our most endangered trees are trees that that we people have cut down too many of for our own uses. Um, and so those are trees that are really important to protect. And Doug, we're, our organization is trying to help people find some alternatives. Like you can use some trees and just stain it or paint it a certain color and it looks a lot like those really rare trees. So there's ways that you can get the same look of some of those products without having to cut down the last trees. Okay, and last but not least, the crew night. Do, do trees have brains? Do trees have brains? Great question. Oh my goodness, you guys are really smart. You know, trees do not have brains the same way we have brains, but there is a lot of cool books out there right now that are talking about the ways that trees communicate with each other. And a lot of times that is like I was talking about through their root systems, but there's also been some scientists that have shown that uh, like when a tree has its, one of its branches cut off, it's it, or if, um, if beetles come in and start eating it, it sends out like a message that other trees can kind of hear around it. So they might be able to shut down some of their systems. So they don't have brains like we do, but they definitely are alive and they have ways of communicating with each other. And I think they can actually communicate with us too. I feel like when I hug a tree, I'm communicating with it. The tree hugs you back, right, Linda? It hugs me back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So go out and hug a tree. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are really running out of time here today. So I want to let everyone know that if you had questions for Linda that you didn't get answered, ask your teacher or your parent to email them to wildclassroom at wwfus.org and we will be sure to pass those along to, to Linda. I'm sure she'd be happy to, to pass some answers back to you. So one other reminder for teachers that are still interested in doing more forest related activities with your students, there's a tiger and forest toolkit available on Wild Classroom that has a really fun activity very similar to the one Linda mentioned. Um, it's kind of a scavenger hunt around your school looking for forest forest items. So be sure to check that out. So I want to thank everyone for joining us today, both on camera and off, as well as Linda. Thank you so, so much. We're going to unmute everyone's microphone now so you guys can give Linda a big thank you. <laughs> thank you guys. It was so, you were so great. Bye, you guys. Have fun. Go out and into the woods.